Hey, lit listeners, Rocket's Lit is turning up the volume for a very special episode celebrating the 80th birthday of one of the greatest guitarists in rock and roll history, Jimmy Page. Join us in a musical journey as we revisit some of the finest moments from our Zepp related past episodes, featuring Led Zeppelin historian and super fan, as well as the Zepp fan magazine tight but loose founder and editor, Dave Lewis. We've also got the inside scoop from Led Zeppelin's former PR maestro and vice president of Swan Song Records, Danny Goldberg, and the one and only Jim McCarty, the Yardbirds drummer and Jimmy's former bandmate. Jimmy, you've done really well. You've had a, had a fantastic career. You're a great guy. I'm wishing you a great 80th birthday. For me, Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin have been more than just musical influences. They've been the soundtrack to my life and the inspiration behind my 2021 novel, Searching for Jimmy Page. As a writer, their impact on my creative journey is immeasurable. This episode is a heartfelt tribute to the man and the band that have woven their way into the fabric of my existence. So buckle up as we delve into the archives, sharing anecdotes and stories that define the magic of Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin. Afterward, I encourage you to check out the full episodes featuring Dave, Danny, and Jim. There are so many more Zeppelin tales they tell in those long-form interviews. And if you're interested in learning more about my novel, Searching for Jimmy Page, tool on over to my website, christyalexanderhallberg.com. I'll put links in the show notes. I had the pleasure of talking at length with Dave Lewis early last year as part of Season 2, Episode 20, an episode that focused on the release of the audiobook version of Searching for Jimmy Page. The paperback and Kindle versions had come out over a year prior. What you're about to hear is a very, very short mashup of some of the main topics of my and Dave's discussion. Enjoy. All right, quiet on the set. It is a tremendous honor to have you here, Dave. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. So right from the start, you have been enormously supportive of my novel, Searching for Jimmy Page, letting me slip in various announcements about the book several times in Tight But Loose. And I just want you to know I really, really appreciate that. That was a huge help. Well, I think the reaction to your book has been amazing. And um, Chris Charlesworth, for instance, who I obviously know very well, um, was very complimentary and, and and if he likes it then you know you you're in the right frame but i think you've done very well and great to see all the reaction that you've got it was a very novel way of doing something about led zeppelin that hadn't been done so congratulations to you well thank you so much i heard led zeppelin for the first time and it was a whole lot of love and this was like nothing I'd ever heard before. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, the riffs were incredible. The vocalist was, was like some screaming banshee. The drummer felt like he was coming through my back door. And, <laughs> you know, the bassist uh, was the best bassist I'd ever heard outside of Paul McCartney. Uh, and, and so it went, this, commu- this incredible chemistry, which came over in this track, struck me, um, you know, like a blockbuster and yep. after that nothing was quite the same because i wanted to know what this group was about i always say led zeppelin is always in the present tense and it just is you know and it's a wonderful thing you could talk about a lot of older bands that have you know fallen off the wayside a bit but that zep they're just you know i mean only this week there's been a new magazine the uncut magazine which comes out monthly here has got a cover story about the 1973 us tour which I did oh, wow. a bit for, and you know it just never stops. So, and and again, when I look at you know what you did with your book, you know there's different angles that can take the story. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of you know sort of mythology with Led Zeppelin, which, which you know people clue into. Um, it's a big, big story with a lot of twists and turns, and and that's the fascination. And I think the fascination for younger people is. It's probably twofold. It's certainly, you know, the music and what it is. But I think the influence of people who want to play music and be musicians and play like Jimmy Page, play in the style of John Barnum, John Paul Jones, and sing like Robert Plant, 
that's going to go on and goes on all the time. People who learn, you know, young kids. I bet there's somebody today, as a 15 year old today, has picked up a guitar and probably played Stairway to Heaven yeah. for the first time. Incredible, I think it's 50 years ago, you know, the House of the Holy came out. Um, and I brought it on the day, obviously, and, and all of that. And it's, they still sound, those albums still sound as fresh as the day they were you know, recorded. And I think that's a credit to Jimmy as a producer. He doesn't yeah. get enough credit, I don't think, for that. He, he's a unique, unique guitarist and musician, but he's, his production values made the sound of Led Zeppelin. They just, mm-hmm. It just did. And he knew how he wanted them to sound. And I've been in his company when he's emphatically explained that, and, and it's been a thrill to hear it from the horse's mouth. He, he knows what he's achieved. He knows. Oh, yeah. And, okay, he hasn't played for a long time. He doesn't owe anyone anything. He doesn't owe me or you or anyone. He's done it. And he's, had, he's having a great life. He's got you know, a lovely lady, and, and he, he does what he wants to do. Robert is different. He carries on. John Paul Jones, again, is a musician, but uh, they've all come out of it so well. You know, I think it's a great – the O2 was a great closure. You know, yes, it would have been great if they'd have done some more dates, but, you know, we all know it's done. You know, that sure. was a wonderful ending. I love your passion, and people, people who love Led Zeppelin – Get it. it. And I, when I first saw them on the screen, the TV screen in 1985, when I was 15 years old, I just became a passionate fan from then to now. And it, it's that band resonated with me in a way that no other band did. They just took hold of my soul. And I right, think part I of it that. has to do a I bit with the totally. mystique. Yeah, I think part of it has to do with the mystique, but ultimately it's the music. The music is what keeps them going, and they were brilliant, are brilliant musicians. Nobody really knows the real Jimmy Page but him. And, yeah, I would imagine he does enjoy the mystique that surrounds it. Um, but you have to have the credentials to to um, have that mystique built around you. So you have to have something intrinsic. And as a genius musician, a genius producer, um, you know, he, he, the coolest rock star that ever walked on a stage, he just <laughs> is. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's just a one-off thing, isn't it? You know, it's not, it's not going to happen again. <laughs> Jimmy is one of the most genuine people I've ever met. And he just, you know, he believes in what he does so emphatically. Um he makes the right, you know, the right calls, and he made the right calls um, during the Zeppelin era. And again, with Peter Grant, who was integral in what they did, and Richard Cole, mm-hmm. who had a great relationship and sadly passed away a couple of years ago. Yeah, it, it took the Zepp thing it was about a team of people. It was like a team, and that that team looked out for each other and knew what the goal was and and nobody moved the goalposts. It was, that's what we're going to do. Nobody's done it before. We're going to do it. We're going to play Nebworth. Well, we'll play it twice. We're going to play our score. We'll do five. Madison Square, we'll do six. You know, yeah. It was just like that. It just was the way it worked and it worked beautifully. And uh, every, we've all got a lot to thank them for. And, you know, they don't owe anybody anything. Um, mm. They've done it. Yeah, and you you know everyone can love the music and listen to the music and the bootlegs and the live concerts and mm-hmm. the YouTube clips and you know in my, you know when I started this magazine a long time ago there was none of that but that was one of the reasons I wanted to spread this word and uh, you know I'm a lucky man to have been able to do it as well as I have yes. and for as long as I have and it it, it goes on in different formats and it will go yes. on. And, Nobody knew all those years ago that it was going to last like this and it was going to have such an effect and enhance so many lives in such a brilliant way. And, you know, that's, I feel incredibly proud to have been part of that and, and continue to be. And, and it's been a privilege for me, absolute privilege. And, uh, you know, I don't take it lightly. I, I just, I enjoy, I cherish it as much as I can. Uh, and yeah. I will do as long as I can. 
Well, I'm glad you've had you've had your great experiences. It doesn't matter what, how, or when you picked up on Zeppelin or whatever, it it affects you. And when it affects you, it makes your life a whole lot better. And that's I've I've certainly found that in many many people. Danny Goldberg has worn many rock and roll hats in his storied career in the music biz. He used to manage Nirvana and served as president of Atlantic Records, for God's sake. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. When we spoke back in season one for episode seven, a celebration of the first birthday of my novel, Searching for Jimmy Page, we focused on his experiences working as Led Zeppelin's PR man and then as vice president of their record label, Swan Song, in the 1970s, when Danny was only in his early 20s. Have a listen to this excerpt, then make sure you check out the entire interview for more great stories about this legendary band. Beat Sound Production, take one. Tell me about the first time you met Led Zeppelin. I met Led Zeppelin in the early part, I think it was March, but maybe it was February of 1973. I was 22, and a couple of months earlier, I had gotten a job at a public relations company called Salters and Roskin, which was a big showbiz PR firm. They had Frank Sinatra, Barbara Streisand, Ringling Brothers, wow. Circus, all these sort of establishment entertainment clients. And Lee Salters, who ran it, hired me to be kind of the long-haired guy that understood rock and roll because it was exploding <laughs> as a business and therefore as a source of PR business. And uh, he asked me one day, uh, do we want Led Zeppelin? And I said, uh, yes. And he said, well, you better come with me to the meeting because I'm the Guy Lombardo generation. I don't understand that music. So, <laughs> so they flew me and him to Paris where the band was doing a show at the uh, Palais de Sport. And we stayed. Oh, I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of, of the hotel we stayed at. It was a very nice hotel in Paris where the <laughs> sure. band was staying. The first day we met with, we were there a few days. I know we saw the show. And then we met with Peter Grant, who managed Led Zeppelin for their entire career. And he was a legendary figure in the music business for a number of reasons. One was he was physically huge. Mm -hmm. 300 pounds, former professional wrestler very intimidating uh, physically and a cockney street smart you know said to know british gangsters type of a guy and another reason he was very well known was because he was incredibly smart at understanding how to represent an artist in the early 1970s music business he really mm -hmm. knew that zeppelin had a unique value and he renegotiated all their deals with concert promoters and booking agents and record companies in a level that at the time was groundbreaking in terms of artists' empowerment and the share of the pie that they got. Then after, after talking to him, uh, then either the next day we met with the band, and it was about a 45-minute meeting, you know, just sort of understanding what they were looking for. It, you know, my memory of it was that Robert was the most sort of outspoken about wanting an American publicist you know, Led Zeppelin, by this time, had put out four albums. The most recent album had been the one with Stairway to Heaven on it. And they were about to release Houses of the Holy, which, which I, by the time that came out, I was their publicist in America. And, but they, I think they already probably finished recording it. I don't know if it was all mixed or anything, but it was already, you know, they, they, they knew those songs and that was going to be the next cycle. They were never a band in those early years that got good press. It's hard to believe, given their mythological status in the rock world today but in the early few zeppelin albums you know rolling stone was the most important american rock magazine they never gave them good reviews nor would they give houses at the holy a good review the headline of the rolling stone review for house the holy was a limp blimp which oh you my know, god i'm a fan of rolling stone i'm grateful for the existence of rolling stone rolling stone's been good to me on so many levels but man they were wrong about that and yeah, uh, yeah. I love Houses of the Holy. It's actually my favorite Zeppelin album because, of course, that's when I first worked with them. So it has this double meaning to me. And in the UK, they didn't get good press either. A lot of it had to do with the quirkiness of generations. And, you know, a lot of these rock journalists uh, started their career in the late 60s, say 66, 67, 68. And the initial uh, pantheon were the Beatles, the Stones, Dylan, and the Who and cream and there was a lot of competition between 
Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page, or at least there was in Jimmy's mind. They had both been members of the Yardbirds, as had been Jeff Beck. Cream came first, and Zeppelin initially was treated as somebody that was sort of imitating them, which again, in retrospect, I still love Cream, but yeah. you know, Led Zeppelin, you know, one far more influential band in the history of rock and roll. But at the time, they just didn't get good press. And then Peter Grant, after the first album or two of this, just said, the hell with it, let's just not talk to the press. So they did the first couple of years, they, they got bad press. The next couple of years, they got very, they just kind of ignored the press. And then in 72, the Rolling Stones had done a tour where the writer uh, Truman Capote was on the road with them and writing about them and got an enormous amount of publicity. And I think what Robert said was that it really bugged him because Zeppelin statistically by that time was actually selling more records and was a yeah. bigger band than the Rolling Stones. They didn't have the longevity, but in the context of early 1973, Led Zeppelin was, was just bigger in terms of any mathematical metrics that existed. And uh, he just was irritated and he thought that his parents didn't know how well he was doing and you know, really wanted credit for what they had accomplished. Again, they just had the Stairway to Heaven album. Uh, Bonham I absolutely understood it. You know, John Bonham was a very complicated guy, but when he was sober, he was articulate and gracious. You know, he was a bad drunk, as has been widely chronicled. And Jimmy did not do too much talking in the first meeting, but it was obvious that he was first among equals in that particular situation and kind of went along with the idea of us. And then, you know, we were the publicist and I was the publicist because Lee Salters really, I think he only met them one other time or two other times, but it was my project. He was dealing with the older, more established show business people. And uh, the band, uh, luckily for me, liked having me around. Again, I was young. I had the long hair. And I made them feel more comfortable than the typical yeah. people that would wear suits or be business types. And I had been well trained by Lee about the mechanics of how to do publicity. And the 73 tour uh, ended up doing very, very well. But when I had uh, first met the Peter you know, on a plane with Lee, he said, tell me about Zeppelin. I said, look, I spoke to some of their publicists and some of the journalists who knew them in the early days. And you know, they had a reputation of kind of being barbarians on the road. There had been this one female journalist named uh, Ellen Sander. Anyway, so I told Peter, I said, you know, their reputation is barbarians. And he just giggled and he said, well, you know, we're just mild barbarians, you know. <laughs> and uh, then it came up in the meeting with the good band. And, and Robert said, look, we were young. By this time, he was only, I think, 25. But when he joined the band, I think he was 19, mm -hmm. you know, or something along those lines. So he said, oh, we were young. We're different now. We know how to be whatever. And in, in truth, Robert was a very sophisticated at dealing with the press. And uh, he was the main person who did most of the interviews. Jimmy would do some if it was important enough. And he was also highly intelligent. He put the band together. You know, and he produced it and he wrote the music. Robert wrote the lyrics. Uh, and he was kind of the first among equals. And for certain uh, articles, he would do interviews, but Robert did more. But that was kind of it. And so I was then, I was the publicist. And the next time I saw them was when they arrived in New York for the 73 tour. I think it was May. They played Atlanta Stadium and then a night or two later, Tampa Stadium. And those were two giant shows. They were both sold out. Atlanta was 50,000 people. Tampa was 55,000, 56,000, like 56,800. The reason I know the number is because I was trying to figure out how do I create good publicity for Led Zeppelin when the, the snobby rock critics, many of whom were my friends, didn't take them seriously. And it was obvious that the best quote unquote angle was to focus on their audience and to say, yeah. you, whatever you think of them, they're, they're the biggest. And then Tampa was the second show, which turned out to be a thousand more people than had seen the Beatles at Shea Stadium because Tampa Stadium wow. had a thousand more seats. And I could write a press release saying the biggest audience ever for a one artist show in the history of the music business, even though there'd been festivals with multiple artists in terms of just one headline act. And that, uh, you know, it was a slow news day. And the UPI was one of the wire services that went into hundreds of newspapers around the world. And. I, I hand delivered a press release to the guy at UPI office in Tampa, and that became uh, the story bigger than the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, biggest record, and that set the tone for the whole cycle. And you know, uh, the the band really never talked to me about it. I didn't know if they liked that approach or not, 
although they did hire me a year later just to work for them. But when they did this um, reunion concert, you would know when it was. Bonham was already dead. But 2007? They, yeah, 2007. I went to that. They were kind enough to get me tickets. Ugh. And they opened it with a video that included the TV I coverage know. of yep. Bigger Than the Beatles. So I said, well, I guess they liked it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, guess I finally so. got my I finally got my response, uh, you know, 30 some years uh, later. Well, tell me about the Kizar Stadium show. That was also on that 73 tour. There are these iconic photos that Neil Preston yeah, took. Yeah. There's one of Robert holding the dove. The yeah, dove is yeah, in his yeah. hand. And then there's one of Jimmy with his arms outstretched. He's all dressed in white and his lips are pursed. And, and that actually is a major motif in my novel. So right. what was that? that show atmosphere like? Well, um, yeah, Neil Preston was, I felt they were always complaining about photos. So I said, why don't you just have your own photographer, put them on the road. And we made a deal with Neil, which is, look, we can throw out any photos we don't like. So they have approval of them. But once they approve the photos, you own them. So Neil, a couple of years later, I saw him driving around a Mercedes in LA and he said, Thank you. This is Thank what, you. <laughs> this is what the Led Zeppelin photos did, and to this day, wow. he's a very nice guy. He wouldn't let me pay him for for use of a photo of, of me and Robert for one of my books because of mm. that. Anyway, you know, Kizar Stadium was another stadium show. There weren't a lot uh, because there weren't that many stadiums that you know accommodated music. That was near the end of the tour in '73. You know, it was another stadium show. Uh, Peter was always kind of arguing. Bill Graham was, you know, the most well known. Uh, concert promoter in the united states he had created the fillmore in the fillmore east and right. he he was particularly powerful in san francisco where he lived and so he did all the big shows there and he was uh, i love bill graham i miss him and he was very very nice to me but him and peter grant were always arguing and uh, these ridiculous ego battles about things that probably weren't very important and so there was a general sour uh feeling in terms of how peter was feeling but the band took their role as performers very seriously. You know, a lot of publicity about Zeppelin focuses on the drugs and the partying and the girls. And, yeah. And that's all true, you know, and they had a <laughs> private plane. And, and they were, um, you know, they did, did have, uh, you know, kind of stereotypical rock and roll fun on the, on the road uh, in the standards of the time. But they were incredibly serious about getting the sound right, about yeah. getting the, uh, uh, they were, very self-critical if they felt they didn't do a good show. Mm -hmm. uh, Bonham, uh, you know, would always do a long sound check to make sure the drums sounded right. They cared about the lighting cues and the amplifiers and every detail of it. And as a result of that, they were um, very consistent in terms of the quality of the shows. I would say 90% of the shows were excellent. There were a couple that weren't quite as strong because, you know, somebody wasn't feeling well or something. But in general... They were very um, professional in terms of what they did on stage. They were very conscious of the fact that the fans, you know, were going to judge them by what they did and that they were going to judge themselves by it. And, and I, I don't remember seeing any bad Led Zeppelin shows. I, I would hear, I know there was one or two where Jimmy had hurt his finger. He felt bad about this or Robert had a right. cold. But I found them to be very, very consistent. And that show is no exception. You know, the fact that Neil captured moments you know has to do with him being a very gifted photographer and an outdoor venue gives you certain opportunities to do things you can't do indoors but as a musical performance it was very similar to all the other zeppelin shows on the 73 tour did they get stage fright before they went on a uh, bonham sometimes got anxious before he went on the other three did not exhibit to me any signs of stage fright, but Bonham could get very nervous. Uh, he carried an enormous weight on the tour because he would do this long drum solo, 15 or 20 minutes, called Moby Dick. So he yeah. was never off stage. In the next part, Danny talks about Led Zeppelin's 1976 concert film, The Song Remains the Same. FYI, Chapter 6 of my novel Searching for Jimmy Page is set at a drive-in where the main character watches that movie for the very first time. Now, back to Danny Goldberg. So how did that film come about? I know that the concert footage was shot at Madison Square Garden in yeah. 1973. Yeah, yeah, was I was so there in those shows. Those were the shows. That was the tour I was doing publicity the first year. So I was at the garden shows where those shows were shot. Mm. 
And then they did later on these pickup shots of the so-called fantasy sequences. I didn't yeah. have anything to do with that. And they went through a few different filmmakers. I, I, I don't really remember the details. I'm sure it's all easy to find out. Whoever shot it, I think, was different from whoever finished it. And like you say, those shows were in 73, but the movie doesn't come out till 76. When I first saw the movie, I saw it at a screening with Peter and Amin Erdogan, who was chairman of Atlantic Records and, you know, legendary character in the history of the music business. I saw it at that time. And I was kind of disappointed in it compared to my memory of those shows. I didn't really think it captured the intensity, but uh, clearly uh, I was a minority. That film inspired many, many hundreds probably of rock bands and millions of fans. And it was one of the best film documents of Zeppelin. Uh, there was a DVD box set that Jimmy remixed the music for and remastered it that came out some time later i think maybe in the uh i don't remember when dvd started but it, either the 80s or you know i'm thinking the 80s or the early 90s and to me those performances were much more faithful to the level of intensity and brilliance of the band than the song remains the same was but the song remains the same has become a classic because it captured and documented that moment mm -hmm. in zeppelin's career and, uh, you know, I appreciate it a lot more in retrospect than I did at the time. I, I was kind of underwhelmed with it because I had been at those shows. That movie means a lot to me. My brother, Steve, who's 10 years older, was a drummer in various rock bands in my hometown, and he idolized John Bonham. So I yeah. was aware of the band at a very young age, but it wasn't until I was 15, and my brother was watching The Song Remains the Same on MTV, and I took one look at the screen and had this visceral reaction to Jimmy Page. Yeah. And that was it. It was over. I was 15. That was it. The Messiah had arrived. He really cultivates that kind of dark image in that movie, especially in the beginning sequence when the camera follows him. He's sitting on a blanket, and he turns around. His eyes are red. <laughs> and then his fantasy sequence at Boleskine House, climbing up the mountain, were you aware of his interest in Crowley and the occult and, and all of that kind of thing? Yeah, I was aware of it. I mean, it's not something that uh, I remember talking to him much about, but I was well aware of it. I think he owned a house that Crowley had owned. Yeah. And, you know, was interested in it. I never got any evidence that it was that big a part of how he looked at himself day to day. He, he was a lot about music. I mean, Jimmy Page and Robert, well, they all were music freaks, very knowledgeable about music and listened a lot to music. But I was aware that he was interested in that, and that's part of the mythology of Zeppelin, that vaguely mystical sense. I think Robert, Robert's lyrics fueled that also in songs like Stairway, li Lyrics to Stairway to Heaven and particularly some of the songs on Led Zeppelin III. You know, they were all influenced by the 60s. You know, they, they just came along a little bit late, but they... They came of age at that time of the Haight-Ashbury. They loved playing San Francisco, I can tell you that. That was always a high point for them because of that and uh, the influence of psychedelics and all that. And, and I think on the album covers, they really they had this team, Poe and Storm. I forget their real name, but that's what everyone called them. And the company was called Hypnosis, H-I-P-G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, like the word mm. Gnostic, you know, which is kind of a spiritual word. And they did these uh, uh, album covers that also created a sort of vaguely cosmic affect around the band. And Jimmy's uh, skill as a, you know, he's one of the great rock guitarists of all time. I mean, absolutely. He's number one, two, three, four, or five. He's certainly in anybody's top 10 and wrote that music too and produced the records, really. They mm -hmm. were engineers and co producers, but Jimmy was, you know, in control of those recordings. So that was sort of part of it, but it was, um, you know, I'd say 75% rock and roll showbiz and 25%, you know, they were not doing any rituals on the road or, you know, <laughs> occult not books. Not killing any like, chickens? You know, there weren't like occult books or esoteric books <laughs> on lying around the hotel rooms or anything like that. Right. But I do think he had a real interest in it. And I think that was, uh, uh, I think a lot of artists were exploring different spiritual paths. And that just sort of became part of what it was to be a rock band in the early 70s, you know, in late 60s. 
and Zeppelin internalized that and it was part of their vibe, you know, no question about it. But I, I think the music itself is the source of the power, not uh, any particular book that Jimmy read. He's a real life musical genius. That's his superpower, as they say. Yeah. Look, he discovered Robert Plant and John Bonham were totally unknown when they joined Led Zeppelin. John Paul Jones was known. Jonesy and Jimmy were older than Bonzo and Robert, like six or seven years older. So Jonesy and Jimmy had played on dozens of big hit singles and rock records in England for people like Donovan and mm -hmm. a zillion other artists and were known commodities. Jimmy had been in the Yardbirds. But Bonham and Plant, Jimmy went out to the country and found them and saw in them what they became. And that was the magic of Led Zeppelin was not only Jimmy Page, but it was that all four of them were great at what they did. That's why that band became what it did. And that was his curation. So not only did he write the music and produce the records and have this vibey look on stage and knowing how to be theatrical with the uh, violin bow and all that and, and to wear cool clothes on stage. But he also had the vision of putting that particular band together. I've had the privilege of talking with the Yardbirds drummer Jim McCarty twice. In our first interview, we delved into Jim's fascinating book, She Walks in Beauty, a nonfiction account about his lifelong fascination with the paranormal and his heartfelt journey to reconnect with his late wife, Lizzie. We also traced his musical career from the pre- and post-Yardbirds days. What you're about to hear is an excerpt from our Season 2, Episode 27 interview, in which Jim takes us on a trip down memory lane, reminiscing about the formation of the Yardbirds, how Jimmy Page entered the scene, and the magic that unfolded during their collaboration. Get ready for an insider's perspective on the musical alchemy that shaped rock history. Roll sound. Rolling sound production, take two. I have been a fan of the Yardbirds since I was a teenager, so this is an absolute treat for me to welcome Jim McCarty to Rock is Lit. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> great. What can, I, what can I say after that? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I should tell you, I bought Legend of the Yardbirds Volume 1. I've still got it. All right. This, that was the first oh, yes. album. Yes. That, was the, that was the first album I, I got of the Yardbirds. And I was a teenager in the mid 80s when I got it. And I, I had fallen in love with Led Zeppelin and Jimmy Page. So Jimmy was kind of my gateway drug to the Yardbirds. And yes. yeah, and, and I admit that I got that particular album because it was the only one in the record store that had his picture on the cover, the only Yardbirds <laughs> record. So I was like, oh, I'm getting that one. But of yes. course, my, my repertoire has expanded since then beyond just that one album. Yes. Well, that's what seems to happen. You know, uh, people were here of the Zeppelin and they're a bit too young to have known the Yardbirds and they, and they trace the history back and, and then they like the Yardbirds, you know, they mm -hmm. go back and they, they see the origins of Zeppelin and yeah, that happens a lot. Then they discover yeah. what, what an amazing genius band the Yardbirds were. So th they're your fans. And, and I just want to point out, everybody, of course, we all know that the Yardbirds boast three legendary guitarists, Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, and my man, Jimmy Page, in that order. But Eric wasn't the first lead guitarist in the band. A guy named Tony Top Topham was the first lead guitarist. So how did the band form? Uh, well, we were, all, we were all friends hanging out in a, in a pub in, um, in a place called Kingston, which was near near where I lived in Surrey, right down by the river, uh, and uh, a, lo a lot of art students used to hang around in there, uh, like Bohemian, as we mm -hmm. called them. The other guys were all from art college, apart from me and Paul, Paul Samuel Smith, and we went to the grammar school. We we'd been mates from, you know, way back since we were about fifteen. And we're still friends, actually, because <laughs> oh, he lives really? in France. He lives in France as well. Now, there were a lot of art students that took to music because it wasn't a very, you know, it wasn't a very hard, hard sort of life in in an art school. I don't think you you did exams or not. You just studied <laughs> art. And... <laughs> <laughs> nice. So they were playing music, including Clapton, of course. 
but uh, Chris Trier and Keith Keith Rell, the singer, uh, and Chris was the uh, rhythm player, rhythm guitarist, and Topham. Uh, that they all went to Kingston Art School, and um, uh, Keith Ralph and Paul Samuel Smith actually formed a band first, and they were called the Metropolis Blues Quartet. A strange <laughs> name, but they played sort of country blues, and I'd I'd never seen Keith before. I, I thought Keith was great, you know, mm. he was this uh, blonde haired guy playing harmonica, and then we finally all teamed up. Because they they wanted to be more rocky and they liked my my sort of rock and roll playing and we all teamed up one night and we formed the Arbor. Well, why did Top leave? Well, Top left because he was the youngest uh, of all of the group and his <clears throat> father was an artist and Top was quite a good artist and he was the, he was the, in the middle of studying art and. Uh, his father didn't want him to be a musician. He wanted him to become an artist. So uh, he put the pressure on him, and uh, he didn't want him to hang out playing all night clubs with <laughs> us lot, you know. Being, being with you degenerate rock star people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, he really had to let, uh, leave, which was a bit unfortunate, you know, for him. But um, enter, enter Eric Clapton. Yeah, so the, the, you know the next one in line was 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 Eric and uh, Chris and Chris and uh, Keith knew him, and he had a bit of a reputation, and he he came in for the audition, and well, we thought, oh, this guy's pretty good. <laughs> okay, but more more first impressions of Eric Clapton. What what? How did he strike you? Besides just being a good guitar player. Uh, well, he, yes, he was good, but he was very keen. He was very enthusiastic, and what he and he was very um, he was very clothes conscious. You know, he was very uh, fashion conscious. He was very smart, mm -hmm. and uh, actually, I thought he was a, a bit of a big head when he when I, when I, <laughs> I thought he's a, you know he's a bit full of himself. I don't know about this guy, but. <laughs> But but we you know we 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 got to we got to know each other we got to become friends and uh, it, you know he worked out pretty well. He worked out pretty well. Yeah, this is 1963, and I love that Keith Relf came up with the name of the band, didn't he? From Jack Kerouac's On the Road, The Yardbirds. Yeah, I love that because yeah. I love that book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it, and uh, it was quite fascinating because the. I didn't know. I'd never heard of the Yardbirds, really. You know, I, I didn't know the book. I, I got to learn that Yardbirds used to hang out in the rail yards, and they used to spend their life traveling on the on the steam trains across the states. And you know, it was quite quite a romantic idea, but it was quite different from us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we were just kids from the suburbs of London. We didn't have to travel around steam trains. <laughs> it was all very romantic. Well, things happened pretty quickly, didn't they? Once you guys, once you got Eric in and everything is gelling, you get a manager, things begin to come together pretty quickly after that. Yeah, I think the thing that did it was we took over from the Rolling Stones. At, at the uh, Crow Daddy Club. Yeah, in, in Richmond, which was local to us. And uh, that, was our, that was our break, really. And we thought, oh, how's it going to be, you know, playing for the Stones? But it, but it was all right. It was good. and, and uh, they they took to us and it went it went it went quick. But we started to gain a lot of popularity. All right. So your breakthrough really occurred when you recorded for your love, and that became a commercial hit, topping the charts in Canada and the UK. But Eric Clapton left the group the day before the single was released, and I, I'm betting he was kicking himself until he got creamed together because it did so well. But I, I read that he didn't like the song because it wasn't bluesy enough for him. Were there other? Was there more to his departure than just his not liking the song? Yeah, yeah, there were there were some issues going on with uh, with the rest of the band, um, uh, probably particularly with uh, Paul Samuel Smith, the, the bass player. He sort of didn't quite. Uh, it didn't quite gel with Eric because, you know, he was a bit of a snob, Paul. <laughs> I 
hope he didn't mind me saying that, but, uh, <laughs> you know, he, 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 his name was made up from Samuel and Smith, you know, so it sounded like very highfalutin. Yeah. Uh, but basically his, his mum didn't want to be called Mrs. Smith. So, uh, so um... they put their, put their names together, his father and his mother, Samuel Smith. Uh, and, um, so I, I don't know. His attitude clashed a bit with Eric and. Uh, he, Eric didn't like the way he sort of took it over and said, well, I, I've got an idea for Four Year Love and I, I'd like to use the harpsichord. And it, it, it was his idea, the way we recorded it. That song is fantastic. I, the harpsichord, the bongos, it's it's got so many layers to it. Yes. It's just an amazing song. So no wonder it took off. Eric Clapton left the Yardbirds in March 1965. Eric Clapton has left the Yardbirds. The Yardbirds are taking off. You guys must have thought, "What in the hell do we do now?" Uh, well, it was it was a bit like my party. You know, it's a bit of relief at the same time. Ah! <laughs> 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 I wasn't expecting because, that. <laughs> because there was, you know, there was obviously someone in the band that wasn't very happy with us, and. He was apart from us, you know what I mean? Yeah. And he was doing a moody sat in the corner. Uh, and so it's, it's very difficult when you're working. You're trying to work as a team. Uh, and, th and there he is sort of sitting in a mood all the time. He's not talking to anybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it was a relief, you know. And then uh, it was Giorgio, actually, our manager, that came up with uh, suggesting um, Jeff Beck. Because they'd seen him playing. He was playing in a band uh, called the Tridents. Mm -hmm. And they'd been playing uh, locally to us in a place called Eel Pie Island, where we played also. And uh, it, it, Giorgio went down and, um, you know, more or less commanded him to, to come <laughs> and audition. <laughs> okay, so the story I always heard was that you you went to Jimmy Page first, or somebody within the organization went to Jimmy Page first, and he's doing session work and saying, um, "I'm I'm doing okay with this. Why don't you go see Jeff Beck?" So that's interesting. That it, it, that that's not actually the way it went down. No, no, you're right. That 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 was right. That as well. It was uh, Jimmy that suggested him. Okay. But but the manager went down to to see him playing uh, after he'd heard that from from Jimmy. Okay, so you see Jeff, you hear him play, contrast him with Eric, because their styles are very different. In, in what way would you say their styles are different? Uh, <laughs> vastly different. Um, well, uh, Jeff has a huge variety of, uh, or had, unfortunately. Yeah. He had a, a huge variety of, of uh, style. And uh, he could play blues as well as Eric, but would play would play jazz and, and play you know what we say is psychedelic. You know, of course it wasn't; it was just him. Mm -hmm. And he could really play off the top of his head, and Eric had to sort of work it all out. You know, same, same as Jimmy that he he worked it he worked it all out, but but Je Jeff was different. Okay, so we're now in the period where Jeff Beck is in the band, but Jimmy Page is also coming in the band because Paul Samuel Smith quits. And yeah. Jimmy Page comes in on bass guitar. That's how desperate he is to get in the band. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. It was quite a change. I, I remember talking to Jeff on the telephone and he said, that, oh, we, well, we have to get Jimmy in now. And the next thing I, I knew, Jimmy was in the band. He was going to take over but from Paul or bass. Uh, so he was pretty. He was pretty ready to to join us. <laughs> how, how long did he play bass? Uh, oh, only a few months. Because Chris uh, switched over to bass. Yeah, Chris switched over with him because it seemed silly. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy played bass and. Chris playing guitar, so they they ended up both playing guitar, lead guitar, Jeff and Jimmy. What was that dynamic like? Because I, I know when it sounds like it, to listen to them and to see them, but what was it like working with these two guys both playing lead guitar? Yes, yeah, it was quite hectic. 
it was, uh, they were trying to outdo each other, uh, you know, in a very subtle way. And they're very different personalities because Jeff, Jeff was very wired, you know, one of his albums, uh, and uh, <laughs> he, he plays off the top of his head. He's very nervous. He's, he's very in the moment. Uh, Jimmy is very calm and he's, he's, mm. he's worked out what he's going to play and he knows like a section man his part, you know, what he's going to do. and uh, So uh, they, they were so different. And, and, and Jimmy was always going to win because he was so calm, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that, that's, an, that's an interesting thing to hear. I mean, not that part because you can, any anytime you see him in interviews, and, and there aren't very many from the 70s, he is so quiet. He is so calm. That part doesn't surprise me. The part that w- when you said that he works out what he wants to play meticulously. You know, I think of Led Zeppelin on stage in concert and, and there was so much improvisation that, that that does surprise me. Yeah, I think well I think he changed after us. I think he did develop that that style a lot more. Yeah. Okay. Now isn't Happenings Ten Years Time Ago the only single that Jeff and Jimmy both played on? Yeah, mm. yeah, and uh, we were, you know, in the book, as I said, Keith and I got the song together, and we had the tune and and uh, all the lyrics, and then um, when when uh, Jeff and Jimmy came into the picture, they suddenly uh, and John Paul Jones played the bass on that track. What? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. And so suddenly it, be, it turned into something else, you know what I mean? Oh, my turned, gosh, I did not know that. It turned into this real sort of rock classic because of Jimmy doing that, 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 that sort of riff and Jeff doing these crazy solos all the way through. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who did the da-na-na-na-na-na uh, part? Oh, uh, Jeff, Jeff. Okay. All right, that's the crazy part. All right. <laughs> so, Jim, what shocked me in the book was that you and Keith really never talked with Jimmy Page about your interest in the paranormal, your interest in, I'll even say the occult. And I thought, you know, I was dying to ask you about that because I just knew that you'd had these deep conversations with Jimmy Page about it because everybody knows he was way into that. He he owned Aleister Crowley's house, Boleskine House, which I've been to. And he had a, a bookstore, Equinox, that was an occult bookstore, and I couldn't imagine that you guys never had a conversation about this. Why do you think he kept mom about his interest while he was in I the other know, words? I don't, I don't know. It's very strange, isn't it? He, he just kept it very uh, on, on a business level all the time. It was just music. And uh, um, and we, we had a laugh. You know, we used to laugh around and, and uh, jo- joke about uh, uh, quite a lot with Jimmy. But he never really went into all that occult stuff with us. Do you think that was? Do you think it was because it was a new interest for him, or he just was not going to talk about it? I, I, I'm not sure. I, I think uh, I think maybe maybe he didn't he didn't want us to know about it. Maybe it was something he you know he thought we wouldn't like or something. I don't I don't I don't know. Okay, well, going beyond that, and going beyond the music and. What were your impressions of him as as a person? What what kind of interactions did you have with him beyond just being on stage or in the studio? Well, it was very very easy to work with. Actually, it was very professional, and uh, you know, coming from uh, the session man yeah. approach, he wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to sort of please us. You know, he wanted to play what we wanted, uh, and uh, he was very gentle and. Easy going. So, what was your favorite album? One of the Zeppelin ones? Uh, of the Zeppelin ones? The obvious answer is the fourth album. That's kind of the meat and potatoes standard. And it's, it's, there's, there's not a clinker on it. Um, I also really love the third one. Yeah. Yeah. So, they did some, they did some good stuff. They were, they were a great band. Yes. Okay. That's a wrap. And that, lit listeners, concludes our journey through the realms of rock royalty in celebration of Jimmy Page's 80 legendary years. Thanks to Dave Lewis, Danny Goldberg, and Jim McCarty for being a part of Rock is Lit. 
and this special episode. Jimmy, your music has been the soundtrack to countless lives, including mine. I just want to say thank you and... Oh, wait, I think Milt Preston wants to grab the mic. Hang on a sec. Hey, Jimmy. It's Neil, and I want to wish you the happiest 80th birthday that you have ever had or ever will have. I'll know what it's like in nine years, but um, have a great one, and I love you. And uh, what can I tell you? Um, your family. So have a great party, and I'm there in spirit, if not in body. Thank you, Neil. Catch my in-depth interview with photographer Neil Preston, Led Zeppelin's only tour photographer, mind you, in Season 3, Episode 42. And don't forget to check out the Rock is Lit episodes featuring Dave Lewis, Danny Goldberg, and Jim McCarty. Links in the show notes. To along over to my website, christyalexanderhallberg.com, to learn more about my award-winning novel, Searching for Jimmy Page. Happy birthday, Jimmy. Here's to many more years of music and magic. Cheers. Rock is lit.